I want to thank the Ingram Publisher uh, Group for uh, making this uh, broadcast possible. And we have Ellen Nita from uh, Ingram. So tell us, what does the publisher services do? do? Yes. We work with uh, publishers that are under our brands, Publisher Group West, Consortium, Two Rivers, Ingram Academic, and Ingram Publishing Services, and we sell and distribute and market their books for them. And they are all working, they're all brands under Ingram. Right, and many libraries uh, use Ingram to purchase their books, and Absolutely. they can probably get all these books. Yes, uh, we're from working Ingram. on putting this list together so they can just go right in and pick them from Kid Lit TV books that were pre presented. Yes, and, and we have Andrew Medlar here in New York City. Well, welcome yes. to New York from Chicago. Thanks, I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, so when did you move? Just not that long ago. It was in March. Okay. It was right before the, the last blizzard. So. Oh, okay, <laughs> yes. And uh, now you're at Book Ops. Now, what is Book Ops? Well, Rocco, Book Ops is just what it says. It's a place where we operationalize the books and other materials that we serve the 150 libraries across Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island, and Brooklyn. And we have 200 great staff working for New York Public and Brooklyn Public Library, several of whom who have been on this program they before. Have. So yes. I'm very honored to be following in their footsteps here. And we do everything from picking the books to ordering them, cataloging, processing, shipping, and distributing them to millions of our neighbors across the city. Yes, and, and we have an alumni uh, from, from our holiday uh, specials, uh, Susanna Richards. Welcome back. What number is this? I think this is number three. And I think and we've I've... only done four, so you've been, uh, you're <laughs> almost a regular. I yes. love that, and we each had to pick three books. So many different things come in threes. So thank you so much for having me. So today, I think my students are a little bit happy because I'm not teaching at Eastern Connecticut State University. Yeah. I'm here on Kidlet TV, so they get to either A, stream this, now or B, watch it later, but I did leave them a little bit of reading to do. And when I'm not at Eastern Connecticut, I get to talk about books here, there, and everywhere. Everywhere, yes. And, it's kind of fun. Uh, the bubbly uh, kid lit person, yeah. as, you're, as you've been described. I'm going to be at City Field, where I think you're going to be yes. as well. We're yeah, going to have uh, For the uh, New York uh, City Public, uh, New York City School Librarians uh, Conference. Dave Professional yeah, yeah, Development, right. which will be yes. really fun. I'm looking forward to that. But, you know, this show is being live streamed, so thank you all for watching. And if you are watching it live, what I would like you to do is to just comment your favorite holiday book, and we'll give that holiday book a shout-out during the show. So remember that. Comment on your favorite holiday book. So I'm going to go back to uh, Susanna and have you begin with okay. your first selection. All right. I'm really excited to share with everybody this book by Catherine Rundell called One Christmas Writ. A wish illustrated by Emily Sutton and it's published in the United States by Simon & Schuster Books. Many of you may not be familiar with Catherine Rundell, but she's done some fabulous middle grade novels including Ruth Toppers and Cartwheeling and Thunderstorms, which was a Boston Globe Horn Book Award winner. But I'm really kind of excited about this book. One, because it's a little bit longer than what we often see for the average picture book, but two, because it's a story about a boy who's not sure his Christmas is gonna turn out the way that he wants. And he's feeling a little bit of lonely. And like in many holiday stories, there are um, ornaments that come to life. Maybe this isn't necessarily a stuffed ornament, but here we have a number of ornaments that come to life. So here we have a story of a young boy who wishes on what he thinks is a shooting star. But in wishing upon a shoot what he thinks is a shooting star, and we're gonna find out what that is later, he actually gets a wish for some friends, and the friends come off of his Christmas tree. And we have a tin soldier, and a rocking horse, and an angel, and all of these come to life. And he falls into a Christmas story and goes on a little bit of a Christmas adventure with a little bit of singing and a little bit of mishap. And I love the illustrations that Emily Sonnen did for this particular book. And I love the fact that this is the perfect book to curl up with a hot cup of hot cocoa with marshmallows and 
or maybe hot apple cider, depending on what your family tradition is. So as you move through, I figure this is either a long one sitting or maybe a two or three sitting book that you could use as you <coughs> curl up around your holiday decorations. So I'm really excited to share this with you. And I will tell you that this boy does get his Christmas wish, maybe even in the way that he would have loved best. So I'm really excited about this book, One Christmas Wish, written by Catherine Rundell, illustrated by Emily Sutton, and published by Simon and & Schuster. Well, thank you. And uh, Andrew. Yes, well, my first book is Merry Christmas, Little Elliot oh. by Mike Corrado. And this is the fifth book about what is, I mean, let's be honest, an absolutely adorable so polka adorable dot elephant. Yeah. Exactly. And Mike's been a, a guest here on Kidlit TV. Well, I'm not surprised. You have very good taste. And that was one of my favorite episodes, oh, I will say. Thank you. They're all published by Holt. And they've done amazing things with this book because the story starts before the story even starts. When you take the cover off, you can see exactly oh, look at that. what this book is. It is a letter to someone very special. Ah. Santa. Santa Claus. And it's from Noel Spirit from Long Hope, Massachusetts. Noel Spirit. Ah, oh, get it? Molly Lane. Get it? <laughs> and this not only tells you that this is a letter, but it also tells you that this book is set in, in a simpler, more historical time period. And you know that because the stamp on the letter is for one cent. Oh. So this is from a very, 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 very long time ago. In the very front cover, we see a child going to the mailbox, oh. opening it up. And looks like it's a wintry, blustery day. It is so blustery that the letter blows right out of her hands and flies away. Well, then we cut to little Elliot and Mouse, who are doing a very familiar, recognizable tradition of visiting a department store holiday window. Then they go inside to talk to Santa. Ah. And Elliot shares his wish. But Santa says that that wish is something that Elliot can only find himself, uh -huh. and that is the Christmas spirit. So setting out to find the Christmas spirit, Elliot and Mouse go to see another holiday tradition, the Nutcracker, when something hits Elliot on the head. So then they go to visit Something else that looks very uh, familiar. The Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. And I, yeah, I'm going to take a moment here because, yeah. Susanna, you have a story about the Rockefeller I, Center I Christmas tree. I pretty much love the Rockefeller uh, Christmas tree. And I think even last year I featured a book called Red and Lulu about the tree. When I was a little girl, this was one of my favorite things about being in New York City. And part of my reason it was so one of my favorite things is because my mom had a little bit to do with it. And as her office sat right above the Rockefeller Christmas tree when I was a little girl, and I thought that was pretty magical. So you've got a good view of the lighting? Um, I think I've always had good views. I have to admit, a lot of things are, um, as you get really old, sometimes you only have one memory. And so it's one big composite memory and other things like that. But every year when I come to the city, because I don't live here anymore, I go and I do pay my little bit of a tribute to the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. What happens to Elliot when he visits? <sighs> Something hits him on the head. Jeez. Hopefully that's never happened to you. <laughs> Well, then, pressing on, they go sledding in Central Park. And something hits Elliot. Where? On the head. head. On the head. Well, before you know it, something else that is flying through the blustery, wintry air lands oh. on his noggin. And it looks oh. a little oh. familiar. And so, opening up the letter, Elliot and Mouse decide that they're going to return it to the sender so that whoever is missing this letter can have it. And in so doing, they travel further and further and further away to a very special house where they are able to provide a gift that only very special people can give, and that is holiday friendship. Oh. I love that. 
So this is a wonderful, wonderful story. From the kid lit point of view, it's amazingly, the, the, the structure of this book is great. The illustrations are beautiful, as you can see. And the story, we also get a bit of a sneak preview of that at the very beginning with the dedication. This book is dedicated for you, the reader. Always know that there's someone out there who cares. So a wonderful book to share with someone that you, you care know, this if, Christmas. If you decide to share this book with a child, there actually is a little Elliot uh, plush. Made by That's merrymakers. Right. Made by merrymakers, yes. So it would be fun. And if you were going to give this as a gift, you can do the book and the uh, plush together. I was yes. even thinking that some kids might even want their little Elliot to deliver their letter to Santa as oh. well, which would be kind of fun. Oh, I think so, very with good. a lot of care. So, a quick question, Andrew. Yeah. Is there a story time at Book Ops? Well, at Book Ops, we are filled with stories every single day, and we're always reading books to each other and talking about the books that we're excited about. So, well, you bet there yeah, is. Yeah, but I think, you guys out there, if you <laughs> have a story, a guest for your story time, and you're in the uh, metropolitan area, look up uh, Andrew, uh, because I'm That'd sure be you're really great. At, uh, well, we know you're great. You, that was a great story. Yes, and Elanita. Yes, so I have um, Father, Christmas, and Me. This is by Matt Haig and Chris uh, Mould. And they both, it's the third book in the series. The first one was A Boy Called Christmas, and the second one was um, The Girl Who Saved Christmas. And Amelia is the girl who saved Christmas, and now she's living in Elfham. And she's living with Father Christmas and Mary, uh, his wife, Mary Christmas. Um, and they, and they are, did, you say, did you say Mary? <laughs> I did. I did. And Amelia's finding that she's having a really hard time uh, fitting in. And th there's wonderful illustrations throughout the book. Here she is, the only human other than Merry Christmas and Father Christmas. And she's trying to get along with the elves. And she's trying to figure out where she, she fits in in all of this. She's very tall. Things are very tiny there. Uh, she tries, uh, like she's in school and she's doing math. And two and two does not equal four. Two and two equals snow, or it could equal, equal a sm soft feather. So it's very confusing for her. She knows she's in Finland, like in the very north part of Finland. However, they don't call it Finland. They call it, she's up in the mountains, in the snow. So she's just trying and trying and trying to, to fit in. Finally, this young boy, Kip, creates this, or makes a really great sled, and she wants to drive it. And she gets the opportunity to drive it. So let's see if I can find the picture where she's driving it. But what happens while she's driving it is that her cat, Captain Soot, ends up on a Blinson and starts, jumps on him because he sneaks onto the, the sled and scares him and so she crashes the sled. Now she really feels like she's out of it. She's really in trouble. So she's trying to fit in and it's not working. She uh, then decides she's gonna run away. And she finds the letter catcher and the letter catcher tells her that she's the one that brought Christmas spirit back to Eltham. That she's the reason that everything is going so well and that she can't leave. What is she doing thinking that she's, that she's not liked? She says, well, Father Bodle, who is, was the head of a, the newspaper at one time and has been ostracized, is doing the Daily Truth newspaper and saying terrible things about her. And this little guy is saying to her, no, that's not true. This, none of this is true. We love you. We elves really love you. Elanita, as I can see, the end pages, which are totally fun. Publishers are doing so much more with the Very end pages, cute. these, mm -hmm. to tell the story, yes. just like what Andrew showed. And just going back to Andrew, the Little Elliot books are published by? Holt. Holt. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so, and now it's, it's my turn. turn. Your turn. Yeah. And so uh, this uh, book has a little uh, magical um, fairy called Tinsel that actually does some uh, magic. Um, and there is a great spread here of some of the magic that happens. And I'm going to say you're going to have to buy the book to, uh, or get the book to see the great spread. No, here, here's okay. one. And I... Uh, it has a happy ending. I'm not going to do a spoiler on this, but it has a happy ending. Of course, it's a Christmas book. It should have a happy uh, ending. And I, I gather that this book was inspired by, the, uh, by Tony's daughter, who, uh, Sophia, uh, who 
actually broke an ornament. So it is called the Broken Ornament. And your book had ornaments in it also, it did. right? It did. And it had a magic. And she uh, uh, and, went. And the ornaments came to life. And uh, yes. so there are all kinds of different things that happened. So these would be a nice pair, particularly for a family who had kids of different ages and wanted different ornament related stories to share. Yeah, and you had a letter catcher in your book. Oh, I'm and in your book, little Elliot is the letter catcher. That's right. Uh, yes, so there's so many similar things in these books. I think sometimes at the holidays, you just can't have just one book. <laughs> no, not <laughs> You at might need all more, than, more than <laughs> that. Both of these oh. books have the Christmas spirit in it. Oh, really and, finding and, it within and yourself. one last thing that I uh, enjoyed was the family putting their Christmas tree up and it is not a real Christmas tree. It is an artificial <laughs> Christmas tree, which just goes to show that you can have an artificial Christmas tree because most uh, children's uh, picture books, the Christmas trees tend to be real. But here we have a, uh, an artificial tree, but it's just as good as a real one. And I'm just curious, do you think uh, that Angela and Tony uh, dress this way uh, for the holidays? I think they do, <laughs> yes. I think they definitely get into the holiday spirit. They do, from uh, their Facebook uh, <laughs> photos, yes. Yeah. And so back to you, Susanna. This is The No Good Nine by John Bemelmans Marciano. And many of you may know John from some of his previous work or maybe possibly his grandfather's work. His grandfather was Ludwig Bemelmans, who created the Madeline books, but John also extended some of those books. But he is also co written and worked on books with Sophie Blackall, The Witches of Benvenido, and he has written a couple of adult books, and he is an amazing writer. I love his writing talent. This is the story of the No Good Nine, or maybe the Naughties. What happens when you get on Santa's naughty list? I know a lot of us have you know, thought about that at different times in our life. And I love the fact that this book begins with our set of nine characters. And although we don't even see all of the nine characters all the time, I will tell you that there are definitely nine of them. And, and their names? Their names are Liar, Know-It-All, Brat, Hooligan, Rude, Cruel, Vain, Glorious, um, Grain, Goody Two Shoes, and Thief. Now, these are not their real names, but they are the names that they come to be known by. And we all know nine people like this. <laughs> I think we right. definitely yes. do. And supposedly one of them is on the naughty list by accident. Sure. Yeah, yeah. that's what they yeah. all say. There's so many things I love about this book. It is dedicated to the So Good Readers of Red Hook, which I think was where John and his family were living at the time. Um, and, and Red Hook is where? A Red Hook in Brooklyn. Because there's a Red Hook, Hook in, in Dutchess County that's also. That's true, near where you live. And but this there, is the Red Hook in Brooklyn. If there's another Red Hook, just let us know in the comments. I'm okay, sure we're, there is. Okay, we'd like this. So this book was published by Viking, and it has just come out. And I'm going to actually start, which is unusual for me, on the first page because I like the first line. The secret origin of the no good nine. You've heard of how bad kids get coal in their Christmas stockings, right? You may think it's a hollow threat, but it really used to happen. And then it stopped in 1932, if you want to be exact. Why did it stop, you ask? It stopped because of us, the no good nine. Maybe you know how we tangled with Tarzan and Journey to Oz, or how we fought alongside um, Buck Rogers in the future and rescued Sherlock Holmes in the Wild West, and how we might or might not have discovered Atlantis. This book, you're going to have to navigate who's telling the truth and who's telling the liar. But there's so many things that I really love and enjoy, enjoy about this book. I think it would take multiple sittings for families to read it, but I think it's a perfect book for middle grade kids, for a six year old, through maybe even a 12 year old. I think they might wanna read it by themselves or have it read to them. And what I love about this is there's also a little bit of history about the 1930s. There's a lot of fantasies. Um, there is a narrator whose voice you may not always be able to trust, but we absolutely love this particular narrator and some people around their holidays send, tend to celebrate with 
um, biscuits and alcohol and all kinds of things. So here we have all kinds of the holiday tensions that might come into play, including a bootlegger. How many great middle grade books have a bootlegger and a few swinging punches here and there. Yeah. The only one I can think of is Al Capone does my shirts. And Al Capone makes an appearance in this particular book. In fact, it's a really kind of important, it's very small, but those of you who might be interested in this time period will enjoy some of the references to the things that um, may have really happened in the 1930s, even though Santa may not have had a heart attack, but it's a good ending, <laughs> and maybe the Elves Toy Factory might have had a slightly different story in some other Christmas holiday stories. Well, it's good that we're sharing that book here uh, in early November, because you can pick it up and read it uh, through the month of November and the beginning of December. And I think there's December. so much great vocabulary in this book, and there are even words that make swearing seem a little less controversial, oh, which is kind of my. fun. Okay, well, we're going to have to find those words. What pages <laughs> are they on? Uh, you know, I, I do think there's a lot of clean fun in this book, and there are a lot of great interactions, and one of the things that I love so much about this book is it really is about loyalty and friendship and problem solving. And so for kids who've loved um, books like uh, by Trent and Lee Stewart, uh, by Trent and Lee Stewart pe people who love Dickens and Dahl, this book is a little bit for me about uh, the mysterious Benedict Society, a little bit of Roald Dahl, and there's a really great Dickens, uh, Charles Dickens feel to this. So I think this has the potential to be a new classic, and just like Dickens and Dahl, it's got a little bit of those complications about personalities. And did you say the publisher? The publisher is Viking. Viking. And I forgot to mention that, uh, that this is Simon & Schuster. It's Simon & Schuster. Yes, yeah. And your next book. Excellent. My next book is published by Candlewick, and it is Coming Home. It's written by Michael Morprugo, who is a former UK children's laureate. And indeed, indeed, and illustrated by Carrie Hidman from England. Question. Yes. So, what is a Laure children's laureate? It sounds pretty fancy and yeah. important, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Right. What do you think? Well, I think it's somebody who maybe loves literature, has mm -hmm. done a lot of writing, and maybe is an advocate for literacy and literature. So it'd be something similar to our ambassador for young people's exactly. literature. The what Jackie, Jackie Woodson's, Woodson's current. Right. Yeah. Yes. I think okay. this one's been around a little bit longer, uh -huh. but I do think that um, the English take their children's laureate quite seriously. Yes. yes, and well they should because he is very deserving in yes. this book. And it's called Coming Home, mm -hmm. and it's about coming home for the holidays. And you'll see this very special character on the cover, this Robin, who represents the thousands and thousands of Robins that migrate every year right about this time from Scandinavia to England. Maybe it's because they want to come and meet the UK Children's Laureate. Oh, Maybe I love why, that. exactly. And so this is a great story about traveling for the holidays. And it can also be a general winter story. It's a wonderful bit of poetry because the text about this journey is in verse. And it's a great science book, too, because it talks about migration. It talks about how and why birds fly. It talks about the food chain because there is a little bit of drama and complications oh. on this journey that our bird friend is making. And it also talks about animal welfare, where a human being rescues the bird and helps him to recover and be healthy to continue on his journey home. As, as you're talking about this, Andrew, I keep thinking about that book that Jane Yolen wrote about the Audubon Christmas bird count, oh, Owl Moon, yes. which won a call to cop many years ago. But I was thinking about what a nice accompaniment this would be to all those people who go out in the middle of the night <laughs> to count birds and right. owls for the Christmas bird count. Yes, and I can just read about them because I'm sleeping usually <laughs> late at you're, night. You're, you're a smart person. So I enjoy reading about it in the books. So like on this amazing spread, we learn that out of the forest, into the daylight, over the fields, follow the valleys, find the river, my river will guide me. And... Did you say who the uh, illustrator is? Yes, this is an amazing English illustrator, Carrie Hindman. Mm -hmm. And I, there is a bit of a spoiler <coughs> alert here. I will oh. say that this does have 
a happy ending where the bird makes it home in time for the holiday. Yet again, this really could be read at any time over the course of the winter and any time that family is traveling to be together with each other at the special time of the year. So it's a, a great STEM book. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Audubon Society uh, actually has a book list. So that'd be a great thing for them to, to add to their uh, book list. Absolutely. You hear that? And I remember on. when the first time I saw Miss Spider cry, and many of them for Miss Spider's tea party, that I was hooked forever. Yes. yes. <laughs> I it's, love all the research that Emily Jenkins and Paulo Zielinski did for this book because they, it has such an authentic feel for anybody who remembers the all of a kind middle grade novels. Mm -hmm. she, I love that temper tantrum. Yes, <laughs> she has a temper tantrum. But her father comes and brings her out so she can be the person to light the first candle on the first night of Hanukkah. So this is uh, approved by the uh, family of uh, Sidney yeah, Taylor, and it's, it's terrific. And, uh, and just so you know, uh, Ella is 12, Henny is 10, Sarah is 8, Charlotte is 6, is six and Gertie is 4. And uh, it, it is nice being old girls, all of a kind. And Papa I think and Mama like to one say. Of, it, one of the things that's really also fun about that story is at the end, even though it's a beautiful story by itself, the author and illustrator, I think, both give us a little bit of information as to sort of how the story came to be and other things. Um, so that's really kind of fun. They, they do. They do. So uh, that's a, a good Hanukkah story. I mean, also, uh, it, you know, December's filled with holidays. It is. Yes. And now... Speaking of uh, holidays, uh, for Hanukkah, I believe you get a gift every night. Yes, lucky. And on Christmas, people get uh, gifts also. So it's a gift-giving time of the year. So as we like to say, uh, give a kid a book. But give a kid a book during the holidays. And so right now, we're just going to have a few gift book suggestions so uh, that people may want to uh, give as a gift this holiday season or any time of the year. Yes. So what is your gift book I, suggestion? I'm keeping with the food theme. Okay, good. I like the food theme a lot. Um, maybe too much. I have America's Test Kitchen, the complete cookbook <laughs> for young chefs. It's 100 plus recipes that you'll love to cook and eat. So this was obviously a collaboration with America's Test Kitchen and it was published by Sourcebook. And I think I'm particularly fond of this because uh, when I was younger, one of my favorite books was a cookbook. It was actually a UNICEF cookbook with recipes from all over the world. And um, my parents were good bookie people, so they helped me keep a lot of the books that I have. So I still have a copy of this that sits in my bedroom today. But what I really like about this book... Just before you tell us about the book, uh, in your house, mm -hmm. how many books are in that house? Well, unfortunately, in the kitchen, they're quite a lot. But um, I have over 45,000 children's books cataloged, and many of those books are in my house, which sometimes seems like it's only big enough for a mouse, because I like to read as many books as possible. I believe in giving books. Mm -hmm. I, my favorite word is free. My favorite phrase is free book. So I try to make sure that everybody has a lot of things. But right now, my goal for the holidays is to make sure there are no books between me and my stove. That's <laughs> Like, <laughs> that is like a goal for That's me for goal. this year. So, um, so I'm really looking forward to doing a little bit more cooking, and I have been cooking a little bit lately. But one of the things I love about this particular book is that this book is so incredibly visual. And whether you're a seasoned cook, whether you've been watching a lot of the adult and or kid cooking shows, or whether or not you're developing your cooking repertoire in preparation to go to something like the Culinary Institute of America, which I think is up near where you live, Rocco, when mm -hmm. you're not here on KidLit TV, this book does a great job of outlining what's up with the ingredients, how to measure uh, prep techniques that we use for cooking, how to grate cheese so hopefully you don't grate your fingers and your knuckles. This is, I have to say, this is one, um, 
Tools make the work easier. I love tools. I don't know about the rest of you, but if I'm lucky enough to get a stocking, I like to get cooking tools in my stocking. You know, my little avocado cutter or a really good grater or something else like that. Prep tools. This is kind of one of my favorite um, pages because one of the things that I did recently with the family I was cooking with is that we checked to make sure that we had all of these in our kitchen. So it ended up being a really good theme even for a Christmas stocking or for gifts for Hanukkah. You could give one kitchen tool every day. Um, so it has um, food recipes for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks, and all kinds of things. Some of them are very, very simple, like hot chocolate that you can make with marshmallows, and other, others of them get more complicated. But here we have the hot, best hot chocolate. We should probably test that here, um, here at some point. And then we have more complicated things, or I like this one, and I picked this one, the sheet pan pizza, because sometimes you just have to feed a crowd at the holidays, and you might not be able to make all those very cute mini paninis with 17 different ingredients. <laughs> but this seemed like something that you could do really well. And it, the recipes are easy enough for me to make, I they're guess. They're so super easy. I think you would really enjoy them, and mm -hmm. I also like a lot of the things that it includes in the back. Conversions and equivalents. Um, recipe stats, understanding nutrition, and other things. I think this is just a perfect book. I love that it doesn't have a dust jacket. Definitely. Sounds perfect. Yes. And uh, well, you thank you. <laughs> yes, you could. Yes. Yeah. And and your gift book. Yes, I love my gift book. This is the 50th anniversary of the publication by Don Freeman and Viking of the very first corduroy book. And I, I think it's fair to say that there's general consensus in the world that this is a classic. Mm -hmm. And there have been many sequels after that. And now in celebration of the 50th anniversary, Academy, Emmy, and Tony Award winning oh. actor Viola Davis has come out with Corduroy Takes a Bow. And this is an amazing and lovely story that follows Lisa and her mother, and of course, Corduroy, on a visit to the theater. And a little bit of mayhem ensues, as you might expect. And also, it's a great, this book is a great primer on the theater itself. So we learn about the actors, and we learn about the costumes, and the sets, and the music, and everything that goes into putting together a production. So this would be a great story to read before taking a kid to the theater for the first time, so they know what to expect. Although with corduroy, there's always a little something that you don't expect <laughs> happening that's going to happen. And I mentioned that there are several sequels to the original book. There are also some great holiday-themed related titles that corduroy stars in as well. And so you could do, I think, a great book package, a great book basket right. of this new book and some of those holiday-related corduroy titles too. And adults that are giving books to kids like to give books that they're familiar with. And you said it's 50 mm -hmm. years. So grandparents may have read Corduroy to their children or you know, their grandchildren's parents. So this uh -huh. is a great way to bring you know, the family back together around uh, Corduroy. Yeah. Viola Davis, yes. And, and there's a word for a person that wins those three awards, or, uh, which we're going to have to Google. I think uh, yes. we are. She's on her way to the EGOT. EGOT. Oh, EGOT is four. That's nope. right, for oh. the four. Yeah, oh. so, oh, yeah. so she gets the Grammy. Oh, Grammy. All together. Oh, I yep. wonder if she read this book. Is, <laughs> did she do the audio of this I book? I think she should, Viola. I know you're watching. <laughs> yes. Let's hear the audio book of Good. this. Yeah, they actually, I guess, give Grammys for that, too. Excellent. Yes. That's right. well, yes. And just like we had a plush for um, little Elliot, yeah, right. there is actually a plush. And I think Yatoy That's makes right. a plush for Corduroy. So if you wanted to have Corduroy reading about his life or read to Corduroy, that would be something that would that be fun. Perfect. basket of Corduroy books Perfect. with the mm. actual With Corduroy, corduroy overalls, of course. Yes, right. yeah, most definitely, yes. Well, well, thank you. So I love books and I love getting books as gifts. Um, a Winter's Promise is probably one of my favorite books, which you can't say that when you are dealing with so many books, but I love this book. Um, it's a trilogy. Uh, it's the first book in The Mirror Visitor. It's by Cristal, and I love looking at this cover, Debo, and it's this wonderful story. It's 470 some odd pages 
a wonderful story about this young woman, Ophelia, and it's a fantasy story. She lives in a different land, which they call Arcs, and she runs this museum. She has a scarf that um, it, it wags its, not tail, but the, it wags like a cat's tail. When she first got it, it tried to strangle her, so now they're compatible. Um, she's able to move through mirrors. That's why she's the mirror visitor. And also, if she touches an inanimate ob object, she can feel the thoughts of anyone who had touched that object before her. So she has some special powers, and she's running um, the, the museum in her world. And she is uh, set up to marry this young man who she's never met, Thor. He lives in a completely different arc, and he's very much, I always say that it reminds me kind of a Viking or Norse. He's very tall, blonde, and where he lives is very cold and very distant. And he comes from a, a dragon clan. And yes, the dragon clan is what you imagine. They're kind of predators. And she moves with him, and he hides her. He doesn't allow her to anyone to meet her. And she's living with his aunt. And she's not, she's kind of, she's a dragon also, not the nicest person. Um, and it's, a, it's an adjustment for Ophelia. There's a lot of things that are occurring for her that happen. Um, she escapes, and then she meets someone that is a mirage, which she doesn't know what, has never known what that is. And a mirage, if you tell me something, and I'm a mirage, everybody in my clan has heard that secret or heard what you've told me. Oh, wow. Oh, so, and she doesn't know this, but um, as she's getting more and more familiar with the world that she's in, she's starting to realize that everything is not as it seems. Then, in order to keep her hidden, they have her wear a costume, and she becomes, um, everybody's meeting her, but they don't really know who she is. It's a wonderful story. I love it. Uh, it's every time you think you know exactly what's going to happen, something changes. It, it's every turn, every, um, everything that you would imagine in a book, this author has put it in here. It was a bestseller in France. It has been translated. It is a beautiful translation. I was actually really surprised because sometimes the translated book is a little awkward. It is not, and her language is absolutely wonderful. As you know, as you hear, I love this book. I highly recommend it. I think this would be a great gift for a YA, 15-year-old and above, if they're readers, if they really enjoy a good story. Also, it's not fast, fast, fast-paced. It's very, um, not methodical, but very thought out in that you get to see the characters and build with the characters. So that's another thing I really loved about it. So this is my highly gift recommendation, and it is by Europa Editions, who is, um, it's their first YA title, 15 and above, and I'm above 15, um, and it's uh, distributed by publisher Group West. Yes, and you know, the nice thing about giving a book. Uh, it wraps it, really well. That's yeah. it, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, yes, it's easy to wrap, and yes, yeah. So Susanna has been here and has heard that before. <laughs> yes, but oh, it or, is. Or I just am trying to think. But you have a gift book too. I do have a gift book. You know, and I'm, as I mentioned, uh, that uh, people buying gift books, uh, I guess, feel a little more comfortable when they're, they know the name of the author and illustrator. And lo and behold, there's a brand new book by Maurice Sendak. And it's a book uh, b with he and author Urinx. And it's called Bre Presto and Zesto in Limbo Land. And it has kind of a story behind it. And Susanna, do you want to share that story? Because Maurice passed away a few he years did. back. He passed yeah, away yeah. a few years ago. And this was, these images originally started as something theatrical. And then he and Arthur worked on a story together. Uh, originally, the images, I think, were from about 1990. Mm -hmm. But then he and Arthur worked on the story together. And then Arthur typed up the story and sent it to Maurice. And then it, as often happens when somebody passes away and you're filing things and other things, the story disappeared, although it didn't disappear off of Arthur's mind. And recently, the woman that has been taking care of... Um, Maurice Sendak's estate, the wonderful Lynn, found the story and reunited it with Arthur and one of Maurice's editors, Michael de Capua. And here we have, in 2018, a brand new Maurice Sendak illustrated and partially told story with the collaboration of Arthur Urings, who apparently, they called each other Presto and Zesto. And Presto and Zesto has cake in it <laughs> and how can you go wrong a we book, like food things yes that has a cake not only does it have cake it has a monster 
It has a wedding, the sugar beet wedding. They're there looking for a wedding a gift, and they have great illustrations by the wonderful Maurice Sendak that just the illustration tells a story. It may not be the story that's here, but you can make up another story right there. You know, and so as they say here, we have a bear with a pair of scissors, and as it says, the bear had scissors, scissors and Zesto remembered what his mother always said. If you see a bear with scissors, run! And that's what's happening right there. And there is so much fun. The words are so much fun. And here we have another one, and uh, the caterer and the caterer's wife, who happens to be in the cooking pot. And it says, ah, Bumbo, shrieked the caterer's wife. Bumbo is the monster. Bumbo, shrieked the caterer's wife. That crook, that thief, he still owes me five bupkas, which is a lot of money in limbo land. And if, you, and if I ever get my hands on him, I'll, I'll. And she ran away. She was so verklempt. Verklempt uh, is a, a good word. Yes, which is a Yiddish word, verklempt. And so there is, uh, and, oh, and, here, and here's our monster right there and uh and there is like a little ode to in the night kitchen with uh i'm not sure if that's presto or zesto right there but it is a great uh book for giving and you could be right there on the cutting edge with a new book by maurice sendak and author yurinx and this is by uh harper and i forgot to mention that this is by a great, uh, an imprint of Random House, uh, Schwartz and Wade. Yes, so, uh, yes. And uh, so we've had so many books. And uh, remember to comment on uh, your favorite uh, holiday book on our website. And, oh, you said there's a list we will put a list of all the books up so that uh, anyone who's ordering through Ingram can go ahead and just pick the kid lit list and just boom, 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 and order or, them. Or yeah. even if you're going to a retailer, your local independent bookstore, which you're also welcome to do on the day after, um, the Saturday after Thanksgiving is Indie Book Day, right? Uh, or, it, and, uh, it's, oh, yeah. it's shop small. Shop small, small and other things. And so you could take that list exactly. to that local or independent bookstore or other things. But one of the things I love is look at the variety of In books. Right. We have a books for read alouds, books for reading to yourself for all different ages. And it's so nice to have a young adult book on this list because we don't always often have a holiday gifty item for young adults. But I think we have everything. And there's so much literary tradition here with uh, extension of people people who've had a literary history for so long and so that's really kind of exciting. And as I said earlier, this is the fourth holiday mm -hmm. special and all four uh, shows are uh, on the uh, Kid Lit TV page. So we have nine books here, but there are many, many other holiday books from the other three shows. Nine times four is what, 36? Uh, okay, if you say so. I think so. so. <laughs> So, so, you know, so. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing these books. And thank remember, you. to give a kid a book, especially for the holidays. <laughs>